And we welcome you to the Bible Speaks Morning Worship Service. Whether you're listening to us on YouTube or whether you're listening to us by public access, we're so glad that you have tuned in. We're going to edify you through the Word of God and exalt the name of Jesus Christ. The message today is entitled, Breaking the Heart of Jesus. What breaks the heart of Jesus? Stay tuned. Right now, let's pray. Father, we ask you to bless every part of this service to the glory of Jesus Christ, our soon coming King. In Jesus' name, amen. If you will turn with me in your hymnals to 648, let's sing Love Divine, All Love Excelling. Love divine, all love excelling, joy of heaven to earth come down. Fix in us thy humble dwelling, all thy faithful mercies crown. Jesus, thou art all compassion, pure unto Founded love thou art, visit us with thy salvation, enter every trembling heart. Breathe, oh, breathe thy loving spirit into every troubled breast. Let us all inherit let us find thy promise rest take away our bent to sinning helper and omaker be end of faith as it's beginning Fix our hearts at liberty Come, Almighty, to deliver. Let us all thy life receive. Suddenly return and never, never more thy temple leave. Thee we would be always blessing. Serve thee as thy host above. Pray and praise thee without ceasing. Glory in thy perfect love. Finish now thy great new courage. Pure and spotless let us be. Let us see thy great salvation perfectly restored in thee. Change from glory into glory till in heaven we take our place till we cast our crowns before thee lost in wonder, love, and praise. Praise God for that. Give him a hand. What a Savior. Our first chorus is going to be, Behold What Manner of Love. It's called the pause that refreshes. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. That we should be called the sons of God. That we 
should be called the sons of God. Once again, behold what manner of love the Father hath given unto us. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us, that we should be called the sons of God, that we should be called the sons of God. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto each one of us, and he has. The next song beneath the cross of Jesus, I choose to take my stand. Beneath the cross of Jesus, I choose to take my stand. The shadow of a mighty rock within a weary land, a home within the wilderness, a rest upon the way, from the burning of the new tide heat, and the burden of the Upon that cross of Jesus, mine eyes at times can see the very dying form of one who suffered there for me. And from my smitten heart with tears, these wonders I confess, the wonders of his glorious love and my unworthiness. I take, O cross, thy shadow for my abiding place. I ask no other sunshine than the sunshine of thy face. Content to let the world go by, to know no gain nor loss. My sinful self, my only shame. My glory or the cross. Give him another hand. He's worthy of it. Praise his special and holy name. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock is our next one. A wonderful Savior is Jesus. Jesus, my Lord, how wonderful Savior to me. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, where rivers of pleasure I see. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. How one Savior is Jesus my Lord. He taketh my burden away. He holdeth me up and I shall not be moved. He giveth me strength as my day. 
He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand with numberless blessings each moment he crowns and fill with his fullness divine i sing in my rapture all glory to God for such a Redeemer as mine. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand praise the lord he covers me there with his hand the next song is aptly entitled he holds my hand Jesus, my Savior, is able to guide from earth to glory land. Nothing can harm me, for he's by my side and holds me by the hand. Say now, he holds. Jesus holds my hand, safely to heaven he leads the way. He is my keeper from day to day. He holds my hand, Jesus holds my hand, the road may be long. But my Savior is strong, and he holds my hand. Danger surround me, and dark is the way, but Jesus leadeth me. He is my strength for the long, weary day. No matter what may be, he holds my hand. Jesus holds my hand. Safely to heaven he leads the way. He is my keeper from day to day. He holds my hand Jesus holds my hand the way may be long but my Savior is strong for he holds my hand he is the one who can keep every a long life's toilsome wound. Trusting my all to his wonderful power, I reach that grim abode. He holds my hand. Think of that. Jesus holds my hand. Safely to heaven he 
leads the way. He is my keeper from day to day. He holds my hand. Jesus holds my hand. The road may be long, but my Savior is strong. And he holds my hand. Praise his name. Jesus is always there holding our hand. The last song we're going to sing is a beautiful song. I love to tell the story. I love to tell the story of the unseen things above of jesus and his glory of jesus and his love i love to tell the story because i know it is true it satisfies my longing as nothing else can do. I love to tell a story to will be my theme in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story for those who know it best. Seem hungering and thirsting to hear it like the rest. And when in scenes of glory I sing that new, new song, will be story that I have loved so long. I love to tell the story. It will be my theme in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. You may be seated. The story of Jesus and his love. The next song is one of my favorites. George Beverly Shea introduced it to me years ago. I'd rather have Jesus. And I thought, yes, that's true. I think every believer that loves Jesus Christ would rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. Richie Stewart now plays it on the harmonica for us. I'd rather have Jesus. Thank you. 
I'd rather have Jesus than anything. Thank you, Richie. We can be heard at any time if you're listening on the public access station and uh, you miss it some week when it's on Monday or Sunday, then you can go to YouTube and you can simply write this in YouTube. Bible speaks all separate words in Laconia. If you do that, then you will find the program is on there. If you want a particular date, just put the date of the program, like September, and you just put the ninth month, number one, and 2019. Then you will get this current program that is today. We have a half hour program every single Sunday night. If you miss it on public access, once again, all you have to write into is on YouTube, Journey into Faith, and the date you missed. And you receive that anytime, any place, even outer space. No, of course not. Right now, we're going to have a beautiful puppet skit by my wife and a little puppet called Judy Ann. And I'm repeating with an E. <laughs> and it is entitled, Hey, Ants! <laughs> Judy Ann, I thought we'd <laughs> start today uh, talking about ants. Ants? Yes, ants. Do you know what incredible creatures they are? Ants are? Yes, they are, absolutely. Do you uh, know how hard they work? They're hard workers. They work all day, every day, every week. They keep working and working and working. Wow, I don't think I could do that. <laughs> Thank goodness we, can't, we don't. But they are also uh, farmers. Uh, and is a farmer? Yes. What do they grow? Well, one species uh, chews up leaves and makes fertilizer to grow mushrooms. Oh, yuck. <laughs> and then there's another group of ants that um, have dairies. You mean with cows and everything? Well, their cows aren't like our cows. Their cows are little bugs called aphids, and they milk them all uh, every day. Do they have chocolate milk? I really, I really don't think so. But let's stop here a minute and let's do some supposing. And then we can get into our Bible lesson. Oh, what supposing are we supposed to do? Well, picture this. You're standing at your garage door facing down your driveway, a nice long driveway down to the street. And you notice this particular day that there's a brand new um, um, ant hill right in the, the um, driveway itself. And down at the bottom of the hill, a car is turning up the driveway and starting up. Now, those ants are in trouble. How do you suppose that you might help them know of the danger and get out of the way? Well, oh, uh, first of all, I'd go right over. And I'd say, hey, you guys, there's danger coming. Get out of the way. Either go in your hole or go to the east or the west. But there's danger coming. Well, do you think that they're going to listen to you? No, because I don't know their language. But you've got to help them. They're going to be run over and they're going to be squashed. So what possibly could you do? Well, let's see. Uh I know. I got the terrific thing to do. Well, what? What? I would, I would, Judy Ant, tell us what you would do. I would become an ant. Well, that's awesome. That's a very good idea. And since I happen to be a great ma magician, uh, I, at the count of three, I can turn you into an ant. At the count of three, I'm out of here. <laughs> well, here we go. One, two, help. Three, poof. Now, now you're an ant. I don't feel like one. Well, <laughs> you, now you're going to run over to the, to the um, ant hole and what? I'm going to tell them that there's danger coming and they better get out of the way. 
and I'm going to wiggle my antennae and however they speak to each other. But there's one problem. What? You're just an ordinary ant. Wh who's to say they'll even listen to you? They'd probably think you were crazy. Well, then I'd be an extraordinary ant, and I would start uh, healing uh, ants that have broken legs and antennae, and I could even raise some of the squashed ants uh, to back to life again. Well, that certainly would get the notice of some of the ants, and if they listened to you and they obeyed your commands, then they would escape the danger that was coming. Now let's go to our Bible lesson. Jesus did just about the same thing you did. What? Jesus became an ant? No, no, no. But just like those ants were in danger, uh, uh, mankind is, was in danger too, in danger from their sin. But our Heavenly Father loved us so much that he sent Jesus to come to this old earth and to warn us about the dangers of of living in sin and the consequences of, of death and hell. And he, he came willingly. Oh, I get it. Jesus became a human being just like us. And so that people would listen to him, he uh, did miracles. He healed the sick and he raised the dead so that people would listen to him. That's right. And just like those ants, if they listened to you and they either went down their hole or went east or west, they would be okay and they would escape the da danger. In the same way, us human beings, if we believed what Jesus said and we asked him to forgive us of our sins and to be our savior, then we would escape death and hell too. And he would take care of us in that way. Hey, that's right. And when we talked about the ants, we were just supposing, right? But when we talk about Jesus, he really did come, and he really did give his life for us. That's right. He became a human being. He became a man to ransom our souls. His were the planets and stars in the sky. His were the valleys and mountains so high. His all earth's treasures from pole unto pole. But Jesus came as a man, a very special man, to ransom my soul. Thank you. Beautiful, Judy and with an E. I've been taught well. Will you stand and turn with me uh, your attention to the screen as we go to Revelation 19, verses 7 to 9. Revelation 19, 7 to 9 is our first reference, and there it is, partially on the screen. <laughs> Let us be glad and rejoice. You know, too many Christians are sour pusses. Have you ever seen some Christians come out of church? They look like they had a funeral. And I don't think there was a funeral. Well, I know of a lot of people that came out of church when I was going to church as a youngster. And some just didn't seem to make it through the service. Blessed are those that die in the Lord. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him, Jesus, glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Right. Blessed are those who are called to be to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. The second reference is Second Corinthians 
11, verse 2. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2. God is speaking. For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. For I have betrothed you to one husband, Jesus, that I may present you a chaste virgin to Christ. He's talking about the body of Christ. He says, I have a godly jealousy over my people. The final reference, Song of Solomon, the third chapter, verses 1 to 4, first part A. All night long on my bed I look for the one my heart loves. Referring to Jesus. I looked for him but did not find him. I will get up now and go about the city through its streets and squares. I will search for the one my heart loves. So I looked for him but did not find him. The watchmen found me as they made their rounds in the city. Have you seen the one my heart loves? Scarcely had I passed them when I found the one my heart loves. It's so important for you and I, before we sit down, say to understand this reality. It is the church looking for Jesus in type. And what it is trying to say is the church goes to all the wrong places to look for Jesus. Jesus is out there compelling the wanderer to come home. Reaching the lost, Jesus is the one she loves, the church of Christ, and is searching for. Let's pray. Father, we come to you and we thank you and we praise you for the word of God. For the word of God is more powerful than any two-edged sword. It is so important that the word of God pierce the hearts of Christians as well as the unbelievers and bring them to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. Help us, Lord God, who are Christians, to really hear the word of God from this message today. And for those who have not received Christ, may they hear, receive Christ as their Savior and be totally changed by the word of the living God. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, and for his glory alone, amen. You may be seated. When Jesus walked on this earth, he was both God and man. Now that's very important because Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary to become not only God, which he never wasn't, but a human being. For only could a human being that was perfect without sin in his bloodstream ever die and pay for the sins of the world. God was in the flesh redeeming the world unto himself. So understand this at the beginning of this message that Jesus Christ is not human and not God when he comes down. He is both human and God. It's called the hypostatic union in theology. It simply means he is the incarnate son of the living God. He is God-man. The man the disciples saw enter into the clouds at the end of his ministry was the same Jesus that had walked with them, he ate with them, shared the word with them, and it was the same Jesus that they heard speak the words of God to the glorify the Father. It was also the same Jesus, by the way, that washed their feet. It was the God-man. And he ascended in that same body. When he was raised from the dead, he was flesh and bones. 
He wasn't blood because the blood had been taken to heaven and the life of the flesh isn't the blood for the Son of God, nor is it the life of a human being once they are in the presence of God. It is flesh and bone. It is human, but it is still totally divine. And that was how Jesus appeared to them after the resurrection as well as in the ascension when he went back to glory. When Jesus was taken up, he did not vanish into a spirit. He simply was taken up and the clouds, it says, hid him from sight. And that same Jesus, that same Jesus, the God-man who will always be the God-man in heaven, is coming in like manner as you have seen him go up. He's coming bodily. He's not coming spiritually. Now, a lot of cults will tell you that Jesus has already come. When he enters your life, he's coming spiritually, but he'll never come bodily. The angels didn't say that. They said Jesus is going to come in the same manner he left. So the word of God says, if you hear that Jesus is in the desert, go not there. If you hear that Jesus has revealed himself in some church and that's where he's staying and you can go see him, he's not there. Every eye will see him that has given their life to Jesus Christ when he comes in the rapture. He is coming in the rapture and in the second coming, he's going to reveal himself to the world Seven years later, they will see the same Jesus that walked on this earth over 2,000 years ago. They will see God in the flesh. Acts 1 verse 11 says this, as the angels make this statement, this same Jesus which is taken up to you or from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Can you imagine that? There's going to be a day when Jesus comes back to the earth. The rapture is Jesus coming in the clouds and catching us up there. The second coming of Christ is he's coming to this earth and he's going to descend from heaven and he will come to Jerusalem and set up his kingdom. The second coming of Jesus Christ issues into the thousand-year reign of Christ on this earth. Note, please, number one on the screen, if you will. We have a man, the man Christ Jesus, in glory, and he went there with all his human feelings. What were his human feelings? What does he still possess in heaven? Because we were made in the image of God and Jesus revealed the same image in us that is the image of God himself. It's not a human image per se, but he came in the flesh, so he's going to appear back in the flesh. But it is who he is in his being. Listen to the word of God. He did not cast off his humanness when he ascended into heaven. No, he is still a man who feels deeply and is touched by our feelings and our infirmities. What you're going through bothers Jesus. Now, he may allow it to be, and he may know it's good for us, but it bothers Jesus because he loves us. Love is bothered when a person goes through something that is difficult. That person you love, it makes a difference in your life. You pray more, you love more, you're concerned more. And the reality is this, that same Jesus is in heaven. He still laughs. Can you imagine? The Word of God says in Psalms, he looks down upon what man is trying to do to him, and he laughs at that sight. 
God is more powerful than any nation. God is more powerful than any dictator. God is more powerful than any president. God is more powerful than anything. So God isn't intimidated by what man is trying to do. Oh, I, we don't need God. God isn't bothered by that other than he isn't willing that any should perish. God still laughs at foolish people. God laughs at the heathen trying to, to say there is no God. God laughs and he says, you are a fool if you say there is no God. The fool that said in his heart, there is no God. It is a non-thinker. A non-thinker is a person that sees all the activities and all the signs that God is and laughs and says, ah, that's just the way it is. The thinker that is a fool, non-thinking fool, says when people say Jesus is coming back, oh, I've heard that all the time. And Jesus says, when they say that, look up for your redemption draweth nigh. Jesus is coming whether I believe in it or not, and I happen to believe in it. Jesus is coming back soon according to prophecies because God's word says that. I need no other justification for saying this is a reality than God's holy word. The word of God makes it very clear. He laughs then at the heathen. He grieves at my not believing in him. I say I believe in him. Things come upon me and I, I just fall apart. I, he grieves at such unbelief. What happened when Lazarus died, the friend of Jesus? The sisters came and Jesus grieved at their unbelief. He grieved that they didn't know he had something better that he was going to do then stop Lazarus from dying. He was going to raise him from the dead after he'd been in the grave for days. You see, he grieves over unbelief. He grieves when you don't think that all things are going to work together for good because you love God and you're the one called according to his purpose. He grieves when I start living in doubt instead of living by faith. The word of God says he rejoices. One sinner converted makes all heaven rejoice. Think about that. There's great rejoicing in heaven because there's one sinner being converted all the time somewhere around the world. It is not a place of morose looks. It is not a place where people say, I wish I was back on earth. No, there's great joy in heaven. And it's joy all the time. And when you enter heaven, you're going to have joy. I remember a, a lady that gave a testimony on the 700 Club. She was mauled by a bear. And the bear was eating her legs, chewing on her legs. And her husband came and tried to get the bear away. And he kept going for her. And finally, she got into the, the cabin and the husband bopped the thing again and got into the cabin and protected themselves from the bear. Now, the thing I want to point out is this. She said, as she knew she could die at any moment, God gave her peace. And that peace made her simply look forward to heaven. And she had two kids, but she knew God was going to take care of them. She had a beautiful husband. She knew God would take care of him. So she had peace and was ready to go. But God said, there's another reason that I have let this happen to you, that you may testify of the faith that is in you and the grace of Almighty God. God rejoiced in what happened, not to the bear mauling her, but to what it produced in her, a deeper woman of faith. And then the word of God says, God sings. I can imagine, I would love to have heard Jesus' voice. It must have been a beautiful voice. I don't know how operatic it was, but I know 
when he sung, the words came to life. They were real solos. And we don't even have an account of that, but he sings. God made us in his, in his image, so we sing. The sing the praises of God. The angels sing the praises of God. And God is also singing according to the word of God. But the word of God also says God weeps. God weeps. He wept over Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I would have gathered you as a hen gathers her chicks under its wings, but you would not. And it says he wept. He weeps over the lost. Do we weep over lost people? Do we really care as long as we're saved that uh, others aren't? And we know according to the word of God, they're going to hell without Jesus as their Savior. Does it make us weep internally? We may not be able to put that on. I don't want you to put it on, but I want it to be a concern when you look over Laconia, when you look over wherever you're living, hey, you should weep over the loss because without Christ, it's going to be a hell forever. And nobody, I don't want anybody to end up in hell, but I know the word of God says hell has been enlarged because so many are rejecting Jesus, rejecting Jesus. And Jesus is the only way according to the word of God. You can't get there by being good. You can't get there by being a humanitarian and all those things may be good, but you have to go to heaven by way of a cross and Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Jesus wept while he was on this earth and the shortest verse in the word of God is that verse, Jesus wept. The voice that Saul heard on the road to uh, Damascus was a voice of Jesus. Jesus had already ascended, gone to heaven, seated by the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us. And Jesus saw Paul, who was then named Saul. And Saul was a persecutor of the church, a killer of young people that were Christian families, a killer of women, a killer of men. Anyone that received Christ was on his list to torture or kill or do both. God met him. Jesus met him. The man Christ Jesus did not ascend and say, well, they're on their own now. Jesus saw what people were going through, the suffering they were going through, the torture they're going through. And Jesus sees that today. He sees the people that are being crucified in some of the countries today for their faith in Christ. He sees the individual who has to watch his wife being raped and then killed before he's killed. He sees it and he grieves over it. Mankind has a period of time to make a decision. And Satan has a period of time to be the small g God of this world. Mankind make a decision. But the moment these dear saints of God who were crucified and raped and tortured die there in the presence of God and they're being blessed eternally and being rewarded for such a deep, faith. So in Acts 9, 4, Jesus says to Saul from heaven, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Well, who was Saul persecuting? Christians. Jesus was in heaven. How can he be persecuted? Because he feels it when we're being persecuted. We're not alone. He feels the pain. He feels the anguish. And he gives us the Holy Spirit to give us comfort in all of that. Are we any better than Jesus? The Father would not deliver the Son before he did what Jesus, what God wanted him to do. And he will not deliver you and I until we have finished the course and we have done what God has planned for our life. We're all in a plan of God. That's why it's so pitiful. And I put it on the board 
back there today how they use the pots of a baby in the abortion clinics. Every part of a baby, and you can see it on that picture, is used by those ungodly people for their own purposes to make money. Money. They get so much for different parts of an aborted baby. And now they're saying, let's abort even newborns because they didn't quite get dead through what we tried to do in the womb. And there's a whole group of people in a political persuasion that have agreed to that. And it's ungodly. It's ungodly. And God's people ought to speak up against that kind of attitude toward the people of God and the children that are born because God has a plan for every one of them. Abort a child, and you may have aborted a pastor that is going to go into all the world and preach the gospel, or a Christian who is going to win people by their witness where they work. Abort a child, and you never know what you're losing. And yet, the abortion mills do it all the time. And the nation is gravitating toward that. There's a group that gravitate away from it, but there's a group that gravitate toward it. Those that gravitate toward it are of the devil. Make no mistake about it. I'm not going to be a person that doesn't say the reality. Anyone that wants to kill a baby in the womb or out of the womb is a devil. And thank God some of them recognize that and stop that. Jesus is saying, you're hurting me. Every time you kill a baby, you're hurting me. Every time you go through terrible feelings of despair because somebody has come against you for your faith, it hurts me. It hurts me. It pains me. We're not here alone. We're here with a God that cares Number two, the sins that break Jesus' heart have to do with love. The sins that break Jesus' heart have to do with love, love. You see, every believer is a member of the bride of Christ. When I received Christ as my Savior, I became part of the bride of Christ. And when you receive Christ as your Savior, you became part of the bride of Christ himself. And God says that bride is special to God. That bride is special to God. God says, I picked the Jews because I chose to make them special. I picked the person that receives my son as their savior because I consider them special. And anyone can receive Christ. It's not just for a few. It's for anyone that chooses to receive Christ as their Savior. Number three, the Bible likens us to a betrothed bride. We are pledged to marry Jesus Christ. It's a pledge. I'm engaged to Christ now, according to the word of God. And I'm engaged to be married. I'm being prepared for a marriage to God's Son. It's indicated in the Word of God that the Father is going to marry the Old Testament saints and the Son is going to marry the Church of Jesus Christ. My friends, God is simply saying, I'm going to make us one with the same hungers, the same thirst, the same creativity. I'm not going to make the bride a little gods, but I'm going to make the bride somebody special for all eternity, and I treat my bride well. Don't make the treating of brides on this earth by men the treating of brides by God. God is the one who has mastered that. 
and tried to teach men on earth to treat their bride the same way. But God is love, and love wants to reveal his love for the bride. You're engaged, you're committed to one husband, and that is Christ. Don't try to understand it all because it's beyond my mind and your mind. Just thank God that he's chosen to do that. Don't try to figure out why he loves you because you can't figure out why he loves you. I can't. I just know he loves me. And that's enough. I don't have to figure out. It's not because. It's because he loves. If it was because, we wouldn't stay loved. But it is not because. It is because simply God is love and he loves us. That's why all the songs that talk about the love of God thrill our hearts and encourage us. This wonderful engagement is going to be consummated in glory at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Think about that. When is that going to take place, Pastor? I can only tell you this. According to the word of God, the rapture occurs, and then after that for us in heaven... We get married to Jesus Christ and have the marriage supper of the Lamb, which will last seven years. Seven years in eternity isn't as much as seven years on earth. You get into eternity and there is no time. But while tribulation is going on this earth, going on on this earth, the rapture has taken us away from that because God said he's not appointed unto his wrath and the wrath is the tribulation of God on mankind. But anyone who's received Jesus as their Savior is taken up to be with the Lord and then married to Jesus Christ and we rejoice. It's based upon Jewish feasts. God gave the Jewish feasts Seven days after a marriage to rejoice. That's why they ran out of wine and Jesus gave a miracle, his first miracle, and caused the water to be turned into wine. He was at a wedding going on for seven days. But you bet it wasn't intoxicating wine. It was wine that God made. And God doesn't make intoxicating wine. Wine. We're going to be married to Jesus throughout eternity. Think about that. You're never going to get bored with that marriage. You're never going to want to be uh, have a divorce about that marriage. That marriage is pure heaven forever. Jesus feels the same way about any engaged man. Uh, any way that any engaged man would feel toward his bride. He endures the same pain any man would feel if his beloved continually praised him, and this is so important, saying, I love you, I love you, I love you, and then showed little attention to the one you said you love. The Lord says, can a maid forget her ornaments or a bride her attire? Yet my people, my people, the ones that say I love you, have forgotten me days without number. Jeremiah 2, verse 32. What's Jesus saying? What's God saying? He's saying, you say you love me, and you say you love me over and over, but you have forgotten me. It's a false love. It's not a true love at all. It is a statement based upon what they know God wants, but they're not living what God wants. David also said in Psalm 106, verse 21, he said of Israel, but they kept forgetting him. They forgot God, their Savior, which had done great things in Egypt. Think about it. The church of Jesus Christ in many circles 
will say they love God, but they'll never serve God. They'll never take time to talk with God. They'll never have the attitude, my life is yours, O Lord, whatever you want me to do. I know you'll give me the power to do it, and I'll do it. They are speaking with their lips something that they're not willing to do or do not do. And that, my friends, in a human marriage is reason for divorce. In God's heavenly marriage, he never divorces. But as we're on this earth, it makes God weep. I wouldn't want a bride who extols my virtues, says loving things to me in public, then later gets cold and doesn't want to spend quality time with me. Why'd you say you love me? Why did you say that I was so important to you? And now, in private, I'm nothing. I'd rather do something else. My friends, when it's referring to God as when it refers to a human being, it grieves the spirit and it grieves the heart of the individual. Note number four on the screen. Beloved, if you do not have quality time with Jesus, quality time with Jesus, a little talk with Jesus every day, if you do not spend time in prayer with him or seek his word, you do not love him. Quote, unquote. I didn't put that down as my quote. That was a quote from somebody who is famous as a preacher. Let me say it again. Beloved, if you do not have quality time with Jesus every day, and if you do not spend time in prayer with Jesus every day or seek his word every day, you do not love him. If I spend time with my wife whenever I feel like it, rather than when she needs me to, my love is very carnal. Worldly. It's not what it ought to be. In Isaiah 57, verses 8 and 10, For thou hast uncovered thyself to another, been unfaithful. He's talking about his bride, the church. And in that realm, he's talking about Israel. And you've gone, thou art gone up, thou hast enlarged thy bed, Thou lovest their bed. They love their bed more than they sow, soweth it. Thou art wearied in the greatness of thy way. Now, my friends, what's that trying to say? It said you love something else more than you love me. And God's people have always seemed to fall into that trap. Some love him with all their heart, and some love other things with all their heart. And that's taken the place of God. The intimacy that should be with God is the intimacy with something else, whether it be another person or something. This is the groaning of a broken-hearted Lord to his people in Israel. He's saying, basically, you're cheating on me. You found someone else because you are weary of being with me. Are we weary of Bible study? Are we weary of prayer? Are we weary of church? Have we found some other lover, something else that we love more than we love God? That's what he's saying here. You have found something else. Number five. In this marriage, I'm speaking of cheating on Jesus, which is spiritual adultery. Spiritual 
adultery. Something else takes Jesus' place. Something else is more important than Jesus. Jesus, remember I said, was a jealous God. He said that. I don't want you to put something before me. I want to be first and everything else next. Even in a marriage, God has to be first. In any union, God has to be first. Anything, God is got to be first. Seek ye first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all those other things will find their place. But put me first. Put me first. Those who neglect Christ are cheating on that relationship. What is another love? It is the love of the world and its things. Listen to John 2.15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. If I'd rather go to some other place than church, if I'd rather do something other than pray, if I'd rather do something than read the word, if I'd rather do something other than be with God, then I have no love for God. That's his estimation. That's not mine. That's his. He says, unless you really love me with all your heart, you don't love me. You don't love me. Your other love could be your job, your career. Whatever takes you away from God is your other love. I don't have time for this. You don't know how busy I am. Then you have a false love. It's whatever takes you away from God being first in our lives. Number six. Whatever consumes your time, your thoughts, your energy is now your first love. <laughs> I can't come to church. I'm watching a soap opera, and I want to find out what happens. Then wait for the repeats, which is better. Don't watch it. That used to be what was a problem early in my life with people I knew. Something came first. It wasn't Jesus. And then there was no time for Jesus. I have only so much time. The people that say, I'll never go to church, when they die, someone may bring them in a casket to church. But it won't help them. It won't help them. You see, Everyone's appointed unto, it's appointed unto everyone to die, and then the judgment. If I don't have Christ as my Savior, the judgment is what I'm going to have. And the judgment is one way, and that's hell. That's hell. We can become ensnared by a false gospel and love it more than Christ. Love it more than Christ. I want to read 2 Corinthians 11, verses 2 to 4. This is in the Amplified Version. I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy because I have promised you one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. But I'm afraid that even as the serpent or the devil beguiled Eve by his cunning, his mind, your mind may be corrupted and led away from the simplicity of your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For you seem willing to allow it. If one comes and preaches another Jesus, not the Jesus of the Bible, another Jesus, whom we have not preached, says Paul, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or a different gospel from the one you accepted you all you tolerate all this beautifully welcoming deception you just say hey I welcome it 
It's deception, but I welcome it. Note number seven. Paul warns we are to follow no one but Christ and his, him crucified. Follow no one but Christ and him crucified. Don't let anything else but the word of God direct your path. For everything in the world is corrupted. The word of God has no corruption at all. It is inspired every word by God Almighty. There is a cult in New York City that has attracted thousands. Think of it. Cults seem to attract thousands like sheep to the slaughter. These people are not in love with Jesus their love is water baptism, water baptism. They say you can join us only by being baptized. You can't be saved unless you come to our church and go through our baptism. Now, I believe in water baptism. I believe that every single person that has received Christ as Savior should be baptized, but that's not my message. My message is Jesus. And the word of God says, this is what I want you to do if you've received Jesus. Their talk, however, does not flow with the love of Jesus. It's all about this other gospel, water baptism. Number eight. How it must break Jesus' heart when we question his ability and desire to do what is best for us. How it must break his heart when we just don't believe that Jesus is doing what is best for us in our life and we go into all kinds of tantrums. The Bible tells us clearly how the Lord took wonderful, wonderful care of Ruth in the Old Testament and Ruth pledged her love to God. She told her mother-in-law, Naomi, as her husband had died, thy people shall be my people, and thy God will be my God, Ruth 1.16. God took care of her. She aligned herself with her mother-in-law, which had a relationship and fellowship with God Almighty. And she said, I want that relationship. And you know what God did? God prepared for Ruth, a rich husband named Boaz. Is, he was part of the families that went back to that. And Ruth married this godly husband, it says. And if the Lord could do that for Ruth, God can do that for us. When I have a need, God can supply it. And if he doesn't, then his word is a lie. He says, I shall supply all your need according to my riches in glory. We have someone who is richer and mightier than Boaz, which was the man that Ruth married. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. We need money. For this church. We need people. Well God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. God can do anything. He wants to do. Number nine. Yes the Lord works everything in your life. For your absolute best. You're his bride to be. You're his bride to be. Paul describes the bride of Christ in Ephesians 5, 27 this way. A glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. God is going to cleanse us so that we have no spot or wrinkle. When we marry him, we will be totally pure and cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. Oh, my friends, it's a glorious church that's going to marry Jesus, and you are that glorious church, and so am I. Number 10, it gives you the definition of wrinkle. 
without wrinkle. Here means fold as on one's face. A wrinkled brow. This speaks of worry and fretting. It is a church that has arrived and no longer does it feel the worry that Satan tries to put upon it and the fretting that comes into a lot of people's lives as they look at their situation instead of focus on Jesus Christ. Paul said there'll be no worry lines on his precious bride's face. They may be there today, but they won't be there tomorrow. It's the best salve there ever is. It's God's eternal salve. The bride of Christ rests in his love. Number 11. <coughs> she is confident he knows where she is, how she feels, what she is going through, and what is best for her. Think about that. God knows where you are, how you feel, where, what you're going through, and what is best for you. He just wants you to tell him because he wants you to express it. But he already knows it. And God has a plan to meet that need. His love, as he bathes us in it, brings peace and calm in the midst of our storms. Dear people, watching by television as well, are you neglecting Jesus? Are you neglecting Jesus? Are you breaking his heart because you don't have any time for him? There's no time to go to church if you're well and you'd have no problems being able to get out. There's no time for you to go to church. You'd rather watch it on TV. Listen, my friends, God never said the TV was to take the place of the church. The church gives you an extension of itself by honoring you with the privilege of watching us on television, but it is not a substitute for assembling together. In fact, the Word of God says, in the last days it is more important to assemble together than ever before. And although many, many pastors will say that, most people won't do it because they have no time. Or they had a bad experience in some church. But God is still God. And he still commends us and challenges us to assemble together in a church that will teach us the word of God. We invite you to come to this church because this is a church that teaches not ourselves, but the word of the living God. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you for the word of the living God and for the reality that once I receive you as my Savior, you keep me. I can't lose it. You keep me. Because you give me a gift, and the gifts and callings of God are without God ever changing his mind. And then you say, I want you as my bride to let me shape you into the precious bride that I have planned you to be forever. I want you to uh, give your allegiance to me and follow me and take time for me and take time for my word and love me first in your life. Oh, God. Help me to do that if I'm not. Help me to commit to you if I haven't. And follow through, Lord God, and not be like some of these people that you give verses on what they responded to. They said, but they did not do. May I say and do. If you've never received Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're not going to get to heaven by being good enough. You can't. You're not going to get to heaven by being a humanitarian. 
good, but you're not going to get to heaven that way. There's only one way. There is no other name given among men whereby we must. The word must is important. Be saved. If you don't receive Christ as your Savior and mean it, you're not going to heaven. And God says, I will weep when I cast you into hell because I did not plan that for you. But your rejection of my son has given you this eternal damnation. Don't let that be said to you. Receive Christ this morning as your Savior. Yes, bow your head and say this prayer in faith, believing to God Almighty. Forgive me, Lord, for all the things I have done and perhaps some things I have not done that you have wanted to, me to do with my life. Forgive me for my sins. Come into my life, Jesus. I give you myself. I want you to come in and I want you to take over my life. And Lord God, I want you to keep me true to my statement today. I will follow you the rest of my life. I will assemble with the church of Jesus Christ and I will read the word of God and I will talk with you every day. I vow this along with asking you to save my soul. In Jesus' name, amen. If you will turn with me in your hymnals to a beautiful hymn that we're going to close the TV audience with, My Jesus, I Love Thee. Let's stand. My Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine, for thee all the follies of sin I resign, my gracious Redeemer, my Savior art thou. If ever I love thee, my Jesus is now. Third verse is the last. I'll love thee in life. I will love thee in death. And praise thee as long as thou And say when the death do lies cold on my brow, if ever I love thee, my Jesus is now. God bless every one of you. We'd like to invite you to our church every Sunday. 9.30 for Sunday school and then at quarter to 11 for the morning worship service. 7 o'clock in the evening we also have a service if you can't make it for those. And then on Wednesday, if you can't make it for anything on Sunday, we have a Wednesday time of midweek service and prayer. God bless you. You're invited to come. The address is 40 Belvedere Street, Lakeport, New Hampshire. That's the Bible Speaks, 40 Belvedere Street, Lakeport, New Hampshire. If we can help you in any way, please write us, and we'll do what we can. Until next time, have a great week.